um, uh, there it is. <laughs> Got it. Okay, good. good. And let's see, do I have uh, screen share privileges? You, I believe you should. Okay, I haven't tried it yet, but uh, before I do that, I just say, say I'm glad to, to be with you. I wish I could be in person, but it's a couple hours uh, nearly drive from here to in Dover, New Hampshire out there. And then, of course, with the weather this evening, it's uh, who knows what might happen. So uh, we prefer to do it this way, but uh, hope to run into you, some of you uh, maybe at, at uh, Marlboro or, or wherever, maybe near Fest coming in May. Do, has anyone, have I met any of you before that you know of, just out of curiosity? Yeah. <laughs> Probably, but, uh, and has, let me ask first, has anyone in the, in the audience here uh, worked, actually worked on the Apollo program directly or a subcontractor or whatever, uh, going back to the 60s? Don't see anybody. Um, I hate to say it, but uh, those of us who work directly on the program are, I hate to say it, dying breed, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, I noticed uh, quite a few of you are roughly the same vintage I am. And uh, and oh, anybody know anybody who worked on the program? Yes, Tom. Uh, what was that connection? Uh, we had a scout master when I was a Cub Scout. Mm -hmm. His name was uh, Howitt. Um, Dave Howitt. I, I okay. Remember he worked on. It. He gave a really great speech on that, and uh, also a good talk on uh, Voyager. Good. Do you know what he did? Did he work? Who, who he worked for? I. Yeah, it's a long time ago. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Well, uh, I'm going to move pretty fast. Uh, I. Uh, I also know someone who. Um, some people that worked on it, uh, George. I worked for Raytheon Company for many years. Right. And, and of course, we did the Apollo uh, computer system. But. Right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, the, the, the Apollo guidance computer, and I had a, I had a direct uh, relationship with uh, MIT Instrumentation Lab, which is now Draper Lab, to develop the interface between the uh, Apollo guidance computer and the, PC, the Apollo spacecraft PCM telemetry equipment, which I would have direct engineering responsibility for in North American aviation. And my contact there was Ray Alonzo at, at Instrumentation Lab, but I was aware that Raytheon actually did the final design and, and production of that, of that computer. So very good. Anyway, let me uh, bring up uh... George. Yes, go ahead. Just a, a quick one. Uh, yeah, I worked at Bendix back when we uh, did some inertial units for the Saturn V. So, right, right. A lot of subcontractors. Uh, uh, I understand there were there was something like um, um, oh, two hundred fifty thousand to three hundred thousand people. Uh, around the country and, and other where and other places that uh, could claim to have worked <laughs> on the program. So everybody seeing my screen share, let me go to um, slideshow mode if I can uh, and start from the beginning. That will eliminate the panels. Okay, everybody seeing that okay? Very good. Let me just toggle here. Okay, it's working. I'm going to go pretty fast. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Apollo uh, project project directly, uh, pro uh, generally, I should say, and then I'll get into the, the details of communications, which I was associated with. I graduated with an E degree from Thayer School uh, of Engineering up at Dartmouth College in, in, Han in Hanover, New, New Hampshire in June of 1962. And uh, <clears throat> a couple of weeks later, I was working at North American Aviation Space and Information Systems Division out in uh, Downey, California on the, uh, in the Apollo Communications uh, Systems uh, Engineering Group. Uh, that division of North America was the prime contractor for the Apollo spacecraft. And they had begun recruiting immediately after they were awarded that contract in November of 61, they began recruiting heavily. And uh, out of the New York office, some recruiters came up to campus and I interviewed uh, them and several other companies. And uh, I wanted to see another, the other side of the country anyway. and. Uh, Having grown up in New England, and uh, and not to mention the fact that my fiance, who is now my wife in the other room here, <laughs> had family had moved out there about a year and a half before, so I had a number of motivations to move out there. Not not the least of which was my father was born and grew up in Nevada, so I just wanted to see what the West was like. So there I was, uh, a newbie, not having any idea what uh, real community, real engineering 
was in the real world and, and working on the Apollo program. And they were uh, they built up that engineering staff there to about 4,000 people over time. So um, here are some of the logos. Um, the uh, North American Aviation logo transition to the North American Rockwell logo. And that is actually designed to be somewhat of an image of the Apollo command module with the, the escape in about uh, with the launch escape tower. In about 1966 or 67, they became North American Rockwell, <clears throat> which was pertinent to my future career since uh, I left uh, the Apollo program after five and a half years in late late 67, went to work for Collins Radio Company in Newport Beach, California, their division there, working on digital data communication systems. And in 1973, Rockwell bought out Collins and uh, they bridged my service. So when I left uh, Collins, moved back to New England in 1977, I celebrated with uh, Collins by 15th, now Rockwell Collins by 15th anniversary of working for uh, for Rockwell. <laughs> Never having gone to work for Rockwell. Now I get a, 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 a modest pension check from Boeing because Rockwell sold all their space and military divisions to, to Boeing and uh, I had earned over that 15 years, I had earned a, a pension. Anyway, uh, so you see the various logos and you see a, a, a diagram here of how the Apollo uh, mission works. And um, I, I, like to, I like to say that Apollo 11 which is, itself was not really the magnificent achievement of the Apollo program. It was the culmination of what I really view as the magnificent achievement, which was the whole program itself. Uh, massive complex engineering program and, pro and product program management process involving multiple many contractors and NASA as the leadership of the Space and Information System Division North American as the prime contractor for the spacecraft, Boeing as the prime contractor for the Saturn One stage, although another division of uh, North American made the, all the rocket engines for the Apollo program, which were a show. It is claimed to be the single greatest initiative in peace in peacetime the world has ever known. Anyway, in in Apollo engineering, there were certain rules of the game uh, that we had, <clears throat> and one of them was use and evolve existing technologies, material systems, components. Don't invent anything new if it's not necessary. In fact, they declared that uh, we had to use pre-qualified parts that were already qualified of the Minuteman missile program, although that had to be, that rule had to be uh, compromised a little bit along the way. Uh, at, a, at a meeting uh, for all the new employees, uh, somebody in the audience asked the management, uh, well, yeah, what if um, what if that the weight penalty and the power penalty for using uh, these older components was too high? And the, and the answer from management was, we'll just build a bigger rocket, <laughs> which I thought was, even as a newbie at the time, was kind of kind of ridiculous. <laughs> So minimize design development risk, uh, choose proven people and contractors. The lowest, the lowest bidder didn't necessarily get the contract. We had to rely on experience and competence. Engineer for adequacy. Excess is more than adequacy is not good engineering design, but the trick is to define what is really adequate and achieve high reliability under the extreme environmental and operating conditions that the uh, uh, the Apollo launch vehicle and the spacecraft on its way to the moon and back and landing was exposed to. Along the way, we had to minimize weight and power consistent with safety and reliability. We had, and we were constantly doing studies, analyzing trade-offs, minor trade-offs just about every week to decide which way to go on, on different uh, design issues. And in those days, of course, we didn't have all the communication facilities and means that we have these days. Uh, it goes without saying, we had to communicate, communicate, coordinate, document, document, document. So how do we get all that done in, in those what might be viewed as the uh, primitive days of uh, communications uh, for big projects? Well, everything was done with paper and pencil initially. And we got there, by the way, and I, I don't know, about eight years, eight and a half years, really seven and a half years maybe. So oh, everything went from uh, paper and pencil to typewriter. We had department uh, assistants, I will call them. Of course, they were secretaries at the time, very competent in getting things uh, transcribed from uh, 
bad handwriting to uh, typed version. <laughs> Internal letters were were all we were that were a massive means of coordination between uh, groups within the, the company I worked for, and they were done on ditto machines. You know the old blue ditto. Yeah, they would make X number of copies reliably. The secretaries had to wear plastic shields up their arms to keep that blue stain off their off their arms and off their clothes. We used slide rules for computation. There were computers available for some more sophisticated stuff using Fortran routines, but uh, most everything that needed to be done was done with a slide rule. Lots of travel, travel and meetings to communicate. Sitting around a table with Guess what? The old uh, paper flip charts. We would get on an airplane with a with a carriage uh, travel tube filled with paper flip charts that the graphic arts department made at the last minute, uh, just in time for us to take them on our on our trip. And there they are. There they are. There. And the Twix terminal. Occasionally, we would use a teletype type uh, Twix terminal, relatively low speed, maybe 300 baud dial up. But that was not really the primary means of communication. The major means of communication was a good old telephone with a dial. And I was on the phone every day for hours. I probably was on the phone for thousands, several thousand hours over that five and a half years that I worked there. And subsequently, of course, up until the, the 80s when we began to use electronic communication. You know. um, but there's one thing we could have do not done without the old good old um, pocket detector. And I'm telling you, people laugh about pocket detectors, but everybody in those days as engineers, we had to wear white shirts and ties and we had pocket protectors. So without that, uh, I don't think the program could have been done very well. Anyway, rocket development was key to the program, large rocket development. Um, that actually began in the late 50s and uh, there were programs uh, underway a couple, three years before the actual Apollo contract was let to North America in, in 61, uh, developing uh, rockets in it with the intent of ultimately using them to go to the moon. There were study programs issued within a year or two years before that contract was issued to multiple aerospace companies to study how best to, uh, to uh, design uh, spacecraft to get to the moon. Ironically, North American Aviation division that I worked with was not one of the contractors that did the study program, but ultimately was awarded the contract to do the uh, Apollo spacecraft design. So there were several mission approaches that were looked at. Nova with a big Nova rocket, the direct launch, minimal earth orbit, translunar flight and landing on the moon with one vehicle. The earth orbit rendezvous where they would put the basic spacecraft in Earth orbit, then they would launch another C-5 rocket, attach it to the spacecraft and fly that to the moon and land directly. The final one that you're aware of obviously is what's called lunar orbit rendezvous, where the lunar module, then known as the lunar excursion module, the LEM, was proposed um, in uh, the 62 timeframe, I think it was finally approved in the 1963 timeframe, and quite a few uh, design changes and stuff had to be made to accommodate that lunar orbit rendezvous approach. This was, was what the kind of uh, the, the proposed direct launch and land on the moon vehicle looked like, very heavy. Um, and of course, this is what the lunar orbit rendezvous dual spacecraft combination looked like with the lunar module there on the left and the Apollo command service module on the right. So the Saturn V had the Apollo spacecraft on top with a, with a launch escape tower, the lunar module adapter, which was a housing in which the lunar module resided. Then there was an instrument unit related to the Saturn IV-B booster. This was the third stage booster. There was no S3 per se. The S1C was the main booster, kerosene and oxygen. The S2 and the S4 were liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen boosted. Uh, five F-1 engines at a million and a half pounds each in the S-1C, five J-2 liquid oxygen hydrogen engines uh, at 250,000 pounds each in the S-2, one liquid hydrogen J-2 engine in the S-4B. 
So there were a whole bunch of missions that most people, there were over 36 missions uh, that involved testing uh, uh, spacecraft from the Little Joe boiler plate developments with the Saturn I to test uh, rockets and uh, mechanical integrity and what uh, land and the landing capabilities. The S-1B uh, was used for preparatory unmanned missions and Apollo 7, which was the first manned mission, uh, which was Earth orbit, which was extremely important mission that tested the ability for 10 days, I think it ran and it tested the ability to uh, dock with a, with a lunar module and uh, to do the rendezvous uh, stuff that was necessary. That was really key because as you remember, Apollo 8, was the one that flew uh, to and around the moon uh, in December of 2000 or 1968, uh, Christmas time, which was a very daring and somewhat risky but very successful uh, demonstration of the Apollo capability. Um, there were, of course, uh, uh, multiple Apollo uh, manned flights. That uh, one of which uh, I think it was Apollo 10 flew and uh, rendezvoused, uh, went into orbit around the moon and uh, uh, decoupled and recoupled with the uh, with the uh, lunar module, but did not land on the moon. And then, then of course, the uh, the 10 manned missions, um, uh, Saturn, uh, Apollo 7, the two without landing, 8 and 10. And one aborted, as we're well aware, Apollo 13, six, six successful lunar landings. Subsequent to Apollo, the Apollo spacecraft was used uh, to uh, in the Skylab program um, and also was used in the joint Russian uh, mission with a uh, to dock in, in Earth orbit. Hey, George. Yes, go ahead. I got, I got a question. What happened to the NOVA? The NOVA was never developed. It was... Uh, I think maybe some preliminary design stuff was done, but the NOVA was never developed. And um, so um, uh, that the decision to go to the lunar orbit rendezvous happened before it, it really was uh, developed. As far as I know, I don't really, I can't really claim to know the, the history of it. Uh, I thought I had. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I'm going to go quickly here. Um, there was moon to earth. You can see how uh, I got to go back one. I got ahead of myself. Here's the here's the moon. Here's the Earth to moon uh, trajectory. Orbit around the Earth. Uh, inject translunar injection. Um, uh, TLI. You may recall the acronym used. About twelve thousand miles out, the Apollo spacecraft separates from the S four rocket, which boosts it into translunar orbit. Rotates 180 degrees and docks with the lunar module, which is in the, ho the housing, the fairing just underneath it. Then they separate, and the S4 is fired and sent off to either crash on the moon or to go into uh, its orbit around the sun. Some of them crashed into the uh, the sun. There, there are multiple S4s on uh, that crashed into the moon. Coming back from, you'll note. So the same kind of thing, you deorbit using the service propulsion system on the service module of the command service module. Um, after rendezvous with the uh, lunar module taking off from the moon, uh, you make mid-course corrections and you come back and land on, on the Earth. And you show this irregular trajectory going landing on the Earth. I'll show that in a second. Um, some basic stati statistics. Um, S1, the Saturn V rocket took off with seven and a half million pounds of thrust. And the thrust to weight ratio was only 1.1 to 1. So you, that's, they all had to work where there was an abort. There was never an abort. Uh, that's why it took off so slowly compared to, for example, a space shuttle, uh, which had a much higher thrust to weight ratio. Um, and I'm told, well, here it is. The, the, it burns 29,333 pounds of propellant and oxygen per second, <laughs> believe it or not, at liftoff. Incredible power there. This is the F-1 engine of which there were five at the bottom of the C-5. You can see how, how large it is in comparison with the people around. Rocketdyne Division of North American made those. Um, then there was the, uh, the uh, Saturn II stage had the, uh, the, uh, the uh, J-2 engines. 
and they are much smaller liquid hydrogen oxygen engine Saturn 4B stage had one of those the Saturn 4B stage was used uh, for final orbital injection around the earth and then fired again to to uh, for translunar uh, trajectory keep in mind the, the Apollo spacecraft had to had to travel at least very close to escape velocity, which is around 25,000 miles an hour from the Earth to get to the moon. Doesn't take much more velocity to reach uh, escape velocity where the spacecraft would go off forever into space and never uh, never come back. Um, some special aircraft had to be built, the pregnant Guppy, which came apart so you could put boosters in it. This shows an Apollo spacecraft waiting to be loaded into one of those. Um, and much ground support uh, construction design and construction was done on Apollo. And, and I don't know the, the percentage of the total cost that went into this, but consider the massive facilities that were built at uh, Houston for the rocket stage development and testing at North American and at the Cape. This is the, this is the, the um, vertical assembly building, the vertical uh, assembly building uh, it was called at the time. Uh, to how to vertically assemble the Saturn V rocket. And of course, the, the crawler was invented for Apollo. Of course, all of these things were later used for uh, the space shuttle missions and are currently being used for the, uh, the current lunar program. And with, of course, modifications as necessary. Here's a Saturn V being transported out to the launch pad. This thing, keep in mind, is over 300 feet tall. And this is a crawler that moves along at about one mile per hour. Um, to the launch pad and becomes part of the, uh, the launch complex when it's there. This is a control room at the Cape, which of course had to control both the launch launch part of the mission as well as the uh, the spacecraft systems uh, in preparation for launch and during the launch phase, actually larger than mission control in Houston. Here's the final Apollo 17 mission taking off from the Cape. I was never available or I never got to watch a launch on the Cape and I'm told that being miles away you could hardly stand the noise and you could feel it vibrating your gut tremendously. So uh, here's uh, out about 12,000 miles, 13,000 miles. Uh, the Apollo spacecraft separates from the S-4, which has now injected it into a translunar trajectory at about 25,000 miles an hour. It rotates 180 degrees, docks with the lunar module just beneath it on launch, and those two things separate and travel to the moon. Do mid-course corrections along the way, and, the, and that rocket engine at the bottom of the service module, of the Apollo Command Service module, was used multiple times for mid-course corrections to go to retrofire to go into orbit around the moon, and then to fire again uh, to fire again uh, to come back from the moon to the Earth and do any mid-course corrections required there. The combination on its way to the moon looked like this. Uh, command service module, you can see the rocket engine, which was hyper fueled by hypergolic fuel that ignites uh, spontaneously when the two are mixed, uh, re not requiring uh, pyrotechnic uh, lighting. You can see the uh, a door off the side, open off the side of the service module, which exposes scientific equipments in one bay of that service module. On the way to the moon, uh, Earth's gravity takes over gradually slows the vehicle down. This is velocity in feet per second. And finally, at a certain point, getting close to the moon, the moon's gravity exceeds that of the Earth and the velocity increases until the retro, retro engine is fired and puts the whole combination of the command service module and lunar module in orbit around the moon. On re-entry, uh, the command module is actually a lifting body, even though well, it's a very symmetrical shape. The uh, center of gravity, which is, which is very carefully controlled, uh, even including the need for ballast, get it exactly where it needs to be. And the center of dynamic aerodynamic lift are offset with each other so that at, at a certain angle of attack, this becomes a lifting body. That's important because the guidance and navigation system uh, is under control automatically of its orientation. So it can be rotated around its axis and it can be pitched and yawed to control its trajectory as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. You see it enters at a very high speed, 25,000 miles an hour. When it gets slow enough, 
the uh, the lifting uh, factor of the of the, com the spacecraft. And by the way, it has since ejected the command the command of the service module. So it's simply the cone shapes command module causes it to actually increase in altitude again, and it can cool off and uh, get out of the um, the phase where communications aren't possible due to the ionization of the uh, heat of reentry. And then the guidance system controls its trajectory till it, till it lands on the targeted landing spot on the ocean. This is a view of, kind of what the, the thing looks like. It's 10 feet, seven inches high. It's 12 feet, 10 inches wide. It weighs about 13,000 pounds uh, until it, after it, it's splashed down because of the use of fuel and so forth, it's back down to uh, 11,700. Even the Russians were interested in it. <laughs> I ran across this somewhere. I don't know where, but uh, I took a little Russian, so I learned how to learn the Cyrillic pronunciation. Obscheye, Ustroisko, Komadnogo, Majulia. Okay, so enough with that. This is one in, in uh, manufacturing on the floor at the uh, manufacturing floor in Downey, where I worked. I could go out there, anybody could go out there and one pat walk past a whole row of these things under construction in various phases. You can see the heat shield has not been put over the uh, over the command module yet. It was full of stuff. And the com communications equipment was located here in the lower equipment bay. But this is just one view of the right. This is kind of a view from uh, the left hand astronauts uh, seat looking toward the back of the lower equipment bay, this was called. Here is the guidance and navigation system and the computer. They had a star sighting capability to uh, make fine adjustments to the inertial nav system, which had uh, three axis gyro rotating gyroscopes. It was, I understand that, that system developed by MIT Instrumentation Lab was, a, was an evolution of what they had, were developing for the Polaris missiles missile system, uh, submarine systems. And uh, so this is a view of a diagrammatic view and the shaded boxes are the various communication uh, pieces of the equipment. These are mounted on what are I call coal plates for cooling. And uh, so there's an active cooling system. Had to be very, uh, had to be very precise uh, for cooling purposes. But keep in mind that all this equipment was made with discrete components. Only two pieces of equipment on the entire spacecraft used the early, very early families of integrated circuits. The Apollo Guidance and Navigation Computer, called the Apollo Guidance Computer, the AGC, used Fairchild Micrologic, which one of the very earliest uh, uh, IC families, and another piece of equipment called the Central Timing Equipment used the uh, use the uh, TI's first family. This was the control panel. These astronauts really flew this thing. They had a lot of switches and knobs and things to control. This was a manned, manned flyable. It had very little ground control capability. The communications area was here. Here are some of the communications. Uh, this is the communications panel. You can see the S-band system. That's, very, that's a key system we'll talk about in a minute. It had a VHF AM system for communication for astronauts and space suits and with uh, space suits and with the lunar module when it was separated from the command module on the on the on the on the uh, ground. It could switch from omni antennas to the high gain antenna on the uh, S band system. You see the high gain antenna here, which was critical for effective communications from lunar distance. Here's um, Apollo 13 actually arriving at the Cape. Here's the high gain antenna. There are also some VHF scimitar antennas around the, at 180 degrees on the service module. Here is one uh, it's be a, a picture taken from the lunar module when it went in orbit over the moon. Again, see uh, the high gain antenna and a scimitar VHF AM scimitar antenna. By the way, Orion looks very familiar. They've used the conical space, manned spacecraft design. They have a service module as well. They still have S-band communications. I believe they have X-band communications. And, and, a, and a main engine, just like the service propulsion system on the Apollo service module. So again, that's what it looked like. Um, I'm going to move along here. Let's get to the lunar module. 
It had multiple antennas. It had a steerable S-band antenna. It had an X-band rendezvous radar antenna for rendezvousing with the, the command module, command service module at um, lunar orbit. It had S-band in-flight antennas and it had VHF antennas. The, system, the communication systems on the, on the, on the lunar module were, uh, were uh, almost a, a, a copy of those on the command uh, in the command module. Lunar module stuff was developed a year and a half or so later after the decision to go to that, that approach to lunar, lunar landing. We provided all the specifications and design information we had developed for the command module uh, equipment to, to Grumman so that they could use whatever, whatever benefit uh, of the work that we'd already done. Although they, they had a different prime contractor for communications, ours was uh, Collins Radio Company, although they didn't build and design and build all the stuff, they had a major subcontract, system subcontract, some of the stuff we uh, design or subcontracted directly. So the, the major segments are in the launch vehicle, the command service module, the lunar module, which I'll concentrate on, the manned space flight network, which is equally important, an extreme amount of build out on the Earth surface for uh, communications with Apollo. And um, Manned Space Flight Network connected to Mission Control, the Manned Space Flight Network, uh, all that, that information, that those communications flowed through Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland and then with high speed links to Houston uh, Mission Control. Key con challenges, distance versus RF power and frequency, weight power, antenna size, uh, proven electronic technologies compatible with the existing ground network, part of which had been developed for Mercury and Gemini. And it had to handle multimedia, voice, data, and television. These are the basic phases. I won't dwell on that, but this chart shows the final design of what methods of communication, what systems of communication were used versus launch phase. And you see a dominance of S-band, 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 S-band at 2000, about 2100 and 2200 megahertz is below the, you know, what we normally use for some Wi-Fi systems. Uh, there's a whole allocation of frequencies in that range for space communication. Unified S-band was the, the name of the system. It had but I'll get to that in a second. It had to end analog voice from manned space flight network to command service module. It had to end analog voice from spacecraft to space suits, uh, space suits using the astronauts audio system. Data from manned space flight center to the command and service module and the lunar module, very minimal data, some uplink guidance and command information to the guidance computer some uplink pseudo-random code ranging, which could range, which could determine the range of the Apollo uh, uh, com uh, command service module to within about a meter at lunar distance. A little bit more on that. And the same with the downlink. This was actually a transponder uh, that turned around the pseudo-random code received by the spacecraft, retransmitted it after a fixed frequency uh, translation and delay back to the earth, which allowed the earth to determine, whoops, sorry, clicking too much. And live to, uh, PCM telemetry, downlink biomed a little from the space screen, and some playback of recorded uh, data when they were out of uh, range, direct uh, range of the earth. Voice, astronaut intercom, band service module to uh, the man to the, to the earth, command service module, extra vehicular astronaut and to the lunar module, and to the recovery forces, and to the lunar module during, and to uh, to MSFN during spaceflight operations. Data was mostly digital. I won't dwell on this, but, but you can see that uh, we had all of the things I've already mentioned here. By the way, the last ditch emergency communications from the command uh, from the astronauts to the earth was actually Morse code <laughs> directly keying a 512 kilohertz subcarrier on the S-band carrier with all other uh, communication uh, subcarriers turned off. Uh, they on their push to talk uh, button on their on their uh, audio cable connected to their uh, their uh, headset mics. They could actually key S key Morse code in, in last resort. That was actually never used. Television slow scan at first, then it moved to a higher 
frame rate, the subsequent developments of the uh, of the camera, you know how important that was. I had a Minolta 1961 Minolta SR1 single lens reflex, the first model SR, uh, single lens re reflex that Minolta developed. That was my uh, college graduation present. And I took these pictures on my home television uh, from I think CBS at the time, I'm not sure, off the screen. I was no longer working on the program at the time when Apollo 11 landed, but uh, I had moved on to Collins at Newport Beach. But uh, this was pretty thrilling for me, you can imagine. And you can imagine seeing the captions live from the moon. That was really something else. So VHF FM was used uh, uh, at VHF extending to 300 megahertz. So we're just below the 300 megahertz uh, transition to what's called UHF. It was used in near Earth if backup voice communications were needing, needed other than S band. It was also used from the service command module to the lunar module to two-way voice and from the lunar module to uh, for data communications from the lunar module to the uh, Apollo spacecraft. And in the spacecraft, in the spacesuits rather, the portable life support systems, known as PLIS, uh, used uh, VHF AM to communicate to the command module uh, directly and when they're out on the moon service to the lunar module. And it was used after landing on Earth in the ocean for recovery communications. Um, so I don't want to get too, I want to kind of keep moving here because time is marching on. Um, the pseudorandom code ranging was very important. Earth transmitted a long pseudorandom sequence of binary data to the over, uh, directly modulating the S-band uplink S-band carrier to the Apollo spacecraft. The Apollo spacecraft um, translated, received that, uh, translated it by a 2221 to 240 ratio to the downlink S-band frequency, but phase synchronous. And when the ground receives that, they, they, um, uh, I think I have a picture here somewhere. Yeah, the, the, the ground receives that. They rec they correlate that with the with the uh, transmitting a pseudo code, and they can detect by that correlation process that digital data. They keep knowing all these delays, and, and they can determine the space transmission delay at just under 300 million meters per second, as we know, and very accurately determine the unknown, which is the distance to the spacecraft at any instant of time. And of course, with other means, uh, including the guidance, the inertial guidance and navigation system, which was corrected, which could be tweaked for correction by star sighting by the astronauts, and um, pointing accuracy of the ground, big dishes on the ground and the and Apollo spacecraft's uh, high gain antenna could determine the angular uh, position of the uh, spacecraft relative to the Earth. So the position of, at lunar distance of the Apollo spacecraft and lunar module were known extremely accurately, which of course they had to be properly uh, calculate the, the, the burn parameters needed to put the combination in lunar orbit and then to deorbit and come back to the Earth and make mid-course correction for both, both on toward the moon and back from the moon. So that was a very important system. It also conveyed, um, uh, by the way, why unified S-band? Because Mercury and Gemini were highly dependent on VH, multiple VHF and UHF transmitters, C-band transponder for tracking. Of course, they were all Earth orbit missions. They, they did have a C-band S-band transponder just for, uh, for uh, ranging. Different modes of communication were required depending on distance. VHF, you know, poops out after a certain distance, but it was decided to use the S band system, unified S band system on its omnidirectional antennas, which were uh, kind of uh, uh, located around the spacecraft, four of them on the, on the cone of the uh, bottom of the cone of the command module um, for Earth operations. But then when the spacecraft gets a certain distance from the Earth, they they switch over to the high gain antenna, which was that four dish array I showed you at the bottom of the service module. And that can be put into either a broadband, medium bandwidth or narrow bandwidth mode. 
uh, by control of the, uh, the astronauts. Also, uh, telemetry had to be uh, was transmitted over the S-band system on a 1.024 megahertz subcarrier. Voice was on the S-band system on a 1.25 megahertz subcarrier. So I think I showed this before. Um, the, there were 85 foot dishes at Goldstone, Canberra, Australia, and Madrid. The moon is 10 times farther away than geosynchronous orbit, which, as you know, is around 22,000 miles. And um, once you get past a certain point at 30,000 kilometers, there is overlap between it, two of the, uh, the, the high gain 85 foot antennas, uh, which are spaced about 120 degrees each around the Earth. So that they can two of them can head have have a view of the uh, spacecraft at any one time, but obviously they're getting the best view when they're when they're uh, in direct uh, axial view of the space of the uh, trajectory of the spacecraft. They're, the components of the communication system were the audio center, which was wired, it gave the astro astronauts uh, uh, you know um, <coughs> intercom capability in the spacecraft and connected to the the VHF and S band transmitters for uh, communication all the other communica RF communication needs. The central timing equipment, which was the one that I mentioned that generated multiple frequency square waves, the time to, to clock and affect multiple pieces of equipment, including what I was responsible for, the PCM telemetry equipment. We got a 512 kilohertz square wave from that equipment. That used internal design of circuitry and used uh, TI, first family of TI integrated circuits. Yeah, you could get a whole flip flop on one chip. You know, the signal conditioning equipment converted uh, analog measurement uh, data, say from a pressure sensor, to a normalized voltage of zero to five volts, which was A to D converted by the PCM telemetry equipment. So everything the PCM telemetry equipment saw in analog form had to be in the zero to five volt range. The pulse code modulation telemetry equipment, whose output bit rate was 51.2 kilobits per second, which actually handled over 320 analog measure, measurements sampled at various rates and about the same number of event, single bit event uh, measurements, switch closures, various event type things. The camera, the television camera was, a, was an entirely separate piece of equipment and connected to the S-band uh, transponder, a unified S-band transponder. And then it was the data storage equipment, which was a, a highly um, a ruggedized, uh, tape recorder, which recorded the telemetry and other communication sources like voice communications when uh, the spacecraft was out of uh, sight of the Earth going around the moon, for example, for other reasons when its orientation was not compatible with direct communications uh, with the Earth. And then there was some minimal update, uplink data, but it was, it, was, it was very minimal for command, for sending uh, guidance, ground guidance information, for example, to the, to the Apollo guidance uh, system. So there were VHF AM transistors, two of them, transceivers, two of them for redundancy and different frequencies, digital ranging generator for uh, getting ranging from the command service module to the lunar module when they were separated and uh, in the process of or landed on the moon. There was the coherent PM transponder, which was used for that pseudo random range code ranging that I mentioned. But when television was used, the FM wideband FM mode of the S-band system was in effect. And there were two S-band power amplifiers that were built by, by Collins. By the way, the unified S-band equipment was built by a Motorola division in Phoenix, which is now another company whose name they that picked them up, I can't recall. There were two of those. They were traveling uh, wave uh, amplifiers uh, and put out about 20 watts. But with losses through the coaxial cabling system, getting to the high gain antenna at the uh, at the uh, base of the surface module, uh, they ended up with about two watts going into the antenna itself. But the antenna had about a 27 dB gain when it was in the narrow band mode, so you had effectively uh, you know 20, 27 dB of gain time uh, uh, over two watts, which gets you up to I forget what, but you know, high hundreds of effective radiated power of watts. It was a VHF beacon, which was used uh, in uh, recovery mode on, after landing on the ocean. 
the pre-modulation processor was kind of a nexus of the communication system, which generated this de de demodulated the subcarriers for the uplink for voice and, and data and so forth, modulated subcarriers for the downlink, controlled the switching of modes of the communication system, of which there were quite a few different combinations of, uh, of modes, which we'll talk about. And also the X-band, then there was an X-band rendezvous radar system, which was used between the command service module and the lunar module for accuracy of, uh, of rendezvous after the lunar module took off from the moon to re reconnect with the command service module before uh, the command service module was uh, powered out of uh, out of lunar orbit on its way back to the Earth. And of course, the lunar module was separated from the command module, service module before that trans-Earth trajectory was, uh, was uh, created by the service propulsion system on the service module. Simplified Brock diagram of the whole communication system. The audio system over here, that pre-modulation processor, which you could see as the Nexus, wasn't a very big box, but it had all the switching gear and, and the control functions for connecting to the other equipment. The VHF AM system operated on two frequencies. The uh, portable life support system, when the astronauts were in suits, either uh, if they had to do an EVA outside the command module, which they never did, or on the moon. Um, Antenna control, manual control panel, the S-band uh, Omni and high gain antennas. Here's the power S-band power amplifier. Here are the S-band frequencies that were used. Uh, the unified S-band transponder equipment, my PCM telemetry equipment, which was contracted to a detailed design and developer radiation inc. In, in Melbourne, Florida, through uh, Collins Radio Company as a major subcontractor system subcontractor with basically Collins took the detailed equipment specifications that we generated. I primarily was responsible for creating and doing systems integration, working with other groups in North America. And they just put a cover their cover sheet on it with a different part number, but uh, uh, they were primarily responsible for designing, Collins was the pre-mod processor, the S-band power amplifier, again, Motorola did the unified S-band equipment, the Almo Victor, I think, did the high gain antenna system. Uh, Collins did the VHF AM uh, transpond uh, systems, audio center. We directly contracted out for our group for the data storage equipment and for the central planning equipment. And Collins uh, designed and built the uh, single condition equipment that I mentioned. This is just a more complicated version. It shows more of the IOs of that same system. There were two major design phases of the uh, Apollo. Uh, the Block 1, originally when they wanted to do the direct landing to the moon, they wanted to uh, carry uh, onboard spares and they wanted the astronauts to be able to do in-flight uh, maintenance, troubleshooting and maintenance, which when you think about it, they, they thought about it uh, after about a year or so after I uh, joined the company and the decision was made to do a uh, lunar orbit rendezvous approach. It's just not practical because these these are modules that are held together by through bolts. They had to carry spares for this equipment. That was an extra weight, their burden. How and astronauts in space suits might be confronted with the requirement to do repair, which is very almost impossible with their gloves on. But this is what the stuff looked like, and it was actually designed, developed, and into uh, initial qualification testing before the decision was made to uh, go to um, um, uh, <clears throat> hermetically sealed packaging concept. And um, so some of the early spacecraft that never launched were using the Block 1 equipment, but in fact, that's the kind of equipment that would have launched on uh, the Apollo spacecraft for Earth orbit mission uh, uh, was uh, experienced the tragic fire on the space uh, spacecraft on the launch pad. Um, so, they wanted to eliminate the plug-in modules, they eliminated C-band tracking, uh, they decided to go to S-band for all communications, they eliminated, they incorporated redundancies integral to the design, including in discrete transistor circuit design and logic design. The equipment was now gas, uh, inert gas filled and hermetically sealed. 
and they they use the quick disc disconnect mill type connectors, the twist lock kind of uh, connectors. So the new stuff, block two design, which started I think around 19 to late 63, probably 1964, was an evolution of the design of the same equipment by the same contractors, but now looked had a whole different packaging form. So these, here's what the unified S-band transponder looked like, the pre-mod processor, it was a very compact unit. This is the PCM telemetry I was responsible for because of all the measurement interfaces, analog and event, digital type, including one with the Abolo guidance and navigation computer, which is a, which is a serial interface for 40-bit data words. Um, you can see all the connectors on that. And uh, so here's what the, uh, the onboard uh, tape recorder looks like. Very organized recorder with, I don't know whether it was a one inch tape or so, but it had to withstand all of the vibration and shock and environmental requirements that were that were required from launch phase all the, all the way through landing. The HF transceiver, which was later deleted, was going to be used in the recovery phase. It was a VHF triplexer for connection to uh, multiple transceivers to, 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 to the uh, antenna system, and there was the digital range generating, uh, generator, which was used for ranging between the command module and the server, and the uh, command module and the lunar module. And this is how it was mounted in the, in the equipment bay. This would be behind the astronaut's feet in the command module, and the guidance and navigation system with its uh, star sighting equipment and the computer and, and the inertia lab platform were in this area. Here's telemetry. You can see the, the mounting of the different units. <laughs> Excuse me. Coffee. All mounted on what are glycol looped uh, uh, cooling plates. By the way, this, this telemetry equipment used about 22,000 discrete, discrete transistor resistor logic components and some for the A to D converter and weighed um, about 22 pounds and only consumed about 20 watts of power. And I won't get into the details of the design, but several different methods of redundant circuit design and logic design were used in this equipment to create, achieve the reliability that was required for a lunar mission, which was 0.99999 probability of not failing of working successfully over a 14-day mission, which was the longest, uh, uh, was the longest mission uh, that was capable. And I don't think, I think the longest mission was actually more like 12 days, probably 17, perhaps. And the other stuff equally designed in the block two phase of design and development for that kind of reliability. Just another picture of that same thing. This was a test a test bed at Collins, I believe, which simulated the low, uh, the lower equipment bay and, and all its capabilities. So the spacecraft was, had a lot of stuff in it. Here's that lower equipment bay with with these communications equipment. Here's the Apollo guidance navigation system. Over on the right, there was a whole bunch of other stuff for the other uh, spacecraft systems. This is kind of a view of the left side. This is actually a spacecraft under test at down and you can see the large uh, bundle of test cables coming in and plugging into some of the various equipment during test. But this gives you an idea of the left hand side. So the astronauts seats are in here, their feet are basically up against this lower equipment bay here. And here is their control uh, panel. Now the basic communication systems, here's the command service module showing kind of over the moon. S band for TV down data voice and, and, and emergency key to the earth back and forth. Um, it has uh, rendezvous radar uh, capability to the uh, lunar module. That does not include a TV, by the way. It had, the lunar module had VHF AM capability to an astronaut's uh, backpack. And then it also had direct S band communications. The Earth. So the ground stations had to be capable of 
a minimum of two simultaneous S-band communication links of essentially the same characteristics, one from a lunar module, later from the lunar, uh, lunar the rover, and from a, the Apollo spacecraft. And in fact, some of them were capable of sustaining three such communication links. Then you see the uh, recovery capabilities using DHF uh, after landing. The spectra of the S-band, unified S-band system, <clears throat> multiple modes. First shows the downlink from the spacecraft. There's a PM, phase modulation mode. The, that pseudorandom range, range code received from the Earth is turned around and remodulates the downlink directly using phase modulation. <clears throat> this is its wideband spectrum because it's basically a digital data stream at about a megabit, megabit per second. The um, the voice is on a, uh, the telemetry is a 1.024 megahertz subcarrier and voice is on a 1.25 megahertz subcarrier. So that shows up symmetrically in the downlink spectrum. When the TV is being used, you go into an FM mode and you have a different spectrum characteristic for the wideband TV. Again, you have the same voice in, in uh, PCM telemetry subcarriers. And there is an emergency voice mode that modulates voice directly onto the phase modulation carrier. All this other stuff is turned off. And then, as I mentioned, there's an emergency key mode where a 512 hertz subcarrier is keyed using Morse code by the astronauts using the push to talk on their audio cable to their headsets. The uplink is similar, and I'm sorry, it's not a exactly corresponding picture. But you can see the voice and uh, uh, update of subcarriers. There's a uh, 30 kilohertz uh, update of subcarrier. And um, the pseudocode, of course, looks the same as the downlink because that's what gets turned, or, turned around by the spacecraft for PRN ranging capabilities. Um, and um, this is the downlink showing what I just showed you before with another. So the antenna systems, uh, the astronaut has a uh, VHF AM antenna. You have the S-band, two kilomegahertz, megacycles at the time, of course, uh, were still used. Uh, S-band, direct, high, highly directional antenna. There are recovery antennas inside the uh, ejectable cone here, the command module, which gets thrown out when the parachutes are, and you have the the S-band omnidirectional antennas, kind of cavity antennas around the four of these around the periphery of the command module. Then there's the VHF omni antennas, which are used when the uh, man service module is talking to the LAM or in emergency mode near Earth to the ground. The VHF antenna is a scimitar antenna. These are mounted on the side of the uh, service module. Guess what, an impedance matching transformer. And this is used, um, uh, I think on aircraft as well, uh, supplied by columns. Um, this is what the uh, high gain antenna looks like. It's folded back against the the uh, rocket cone of the uh, surface propulsion system uh, during uh, obviously liftoff and, and until it's uh, deployed during translunar flight. And it's steerable in multiple axes so it can point at the Earth. And these, these multiple dishes give it um, Capability for narrow band or medium bandwidth or wide wide beam width uh, communications capability. The lunar module, like I say, had a parallel system of communications options uh, equipment rather, and uh, package totally different. Different major subcontractor. I think RCA was the major subcontractor for this system, but a lot of it was subcontracted. But the uh, the form factor and the packaging requirements and the antenna requirements based on the design of lunar module were quite different. But it had all the same basic functional capabilities that the command module communications had. And I think you can see the rendezvous radar, X-band, the S-band steerable antenna to talk directly to the Earth, VHF antennas, S-band in-flight antennas, and uh, other stuff. So, when the lunar module is on the ground, it's communicating S-band directly to the Earth with its steerable antenna. Um, 
and you and for PR and ranging and invoice on the uh, the, the downlink is 2101.8 megahertz the uplink is 2222.5 megahertz and uh, these clones are controllable by the astronauts in the lunar module similar capabilities to the uh, but you see that all of the communications between the command module command service module and the lunar module are VHF AM why AM not FM you know FM has a uh, a threshold where we're free, we're familiar with, and we talk about if the signal to noise ratio of the RF signal gets high enough, suddenly the noise seems to go away and all you hear is the voice. But that's that's both good and bad because you get that sudden drop out if the signal to noise, RF signal to noise ratio falls below a certain point. With AM, that's not the case. The relationship between signal to noise ratio of the demodulated audio and the incoming RF carrier are linear. So you will, if you will, if the signal is strong enough, you will hear very strong audio and almost no background noise. As the uh, signal noise ratio of the RF decreases, you'll hear increasing noise in the background uh, of the uh, of the AM signal. But there's you don't get this sudden dropout. So even in very noisy conditions, it's very possible to hear AM voice through through uh, the noise. And by that's one of the reasons that VHF AM is still used by the worldwide air traffic control system. All aircraft communications, not for air traffic control, are VHF AM mode. And part of that is for historical compatibility of older aircraft. But there's also this important uh, performance factor of uh, uh, linear degradation of uh, signal noise ratio uh, and still being able to uh, get intelligible voice. Uh, even in uh, high, highly noisier conditions. Now, on the on the lunar surface, uh, the LEM deploys a foldable S-band antenna and points it to the Earth. And uh, the astronauts are now talking to each other and to the Earth via VHF AM. The AM is trans translated to the S-band system uh, within the lunar module equipment. And so the communications to the Earth are back and forth are by the unified S-band system. <laughs> You'll note that one of the astronauts is only getting voice input and the other astronaut is both transmitting and receiving voice. So one of the astronauts actually has a VHF AM um, repeater built into his space is part of a life support system. So he is serving as an AM repeater for, for the other astronaut talking um, uh, to the Earth to mission control and to the other and between the two astronauts. One of the astronauts has a camera, but it has a cable all the way back to the to the lunar module, so it can be connected to the uh, unified S-band system for transmission to the Earth. Uh, again, back again to the directional and the S-band directional antenna. So here's another kind of picture of that. Let me see what we're at here. Uh, yeah. Okay. So for the Apollo's 11, 12, and 14, there was no lunar rover. So what I just showed you is effectively what's happening. This this is just another kind of uh, schematic. Uh, that type of communication. So, not, again, this guy has the AM repeater. This guy is only receiving voice from this astronaut or, or mission control. This guy is both transmitting and receiving voice. <coughs> Later missions, 15, 16, and 17, the lunar rover comes into the picture. And it has the capability of direct S band communications with the Earth via its high gain antenna. And I've got to point out that the large diameter ground stations are now required really for effective communication. So you have three 85 foot dishes at Madrid, Goldstone and Canberra. And you had multiple 30 foot dishes scattered elsewhere around the world. And then you also had the 210 foot NASA JPL deep space antennas at Goldstone Madrid, and Australia which actually were, were used for TV transmission because it turned out that the wide bandwidth of the television system 
required much higher grounds, ground uh, reception gain uh, to get a good signal to noise ratio for a clean picture. And all those signal margins were analyzed and calculated. In fact, the guy that did that work for North American was uh, in my group. Actually, before I left North American for a while, he was under my supervision, but uh, <clears throat> he did all the, uh, the uh, calculations from the S-band transponder and power amplifiers through all the cabling, the connectors, the antenna systems to and from the moon to determine how, <clears throat> what signal noise ratio would it occur. And it was marginal for TV unless they used the very large ground station antennas. And spaceflight network, everything flowed through Goddard, Goddard Space Flight Center. You can see all the different uh, ground station sites around the world. Here's here's Goldstone. Here's uh, uh, Madrid. Oops, sorry, didn't click on thing. Here's uh, uh, Australia, and then the other the other sites. Um, and it shows the types of lines that were connected to Goldstone through undersea cables, land lines, and whatever was required. There was some data that came in via via communication satellite. Um, later, NASA was actually in the later stages. Apollo was developing the, uh, the satellite relay system, uh, which they have used since for, for for synchronous or satellite relay of, of a lot of communications from the Earth tracking stations to, to the mission control. But Goddard received all this stuff and then there were high-speed links to mission control from Goddard. So Goddard managed the data flow and configuration of the manned spaceflight network. There were 30-foot para para parabolas with 43 dB of gain and 85-foot parabolas with 82 dB of gain. You can see the different beam widths. Uh, then there were the 203, 210 foot deep space parameters, Goldstone, the grid. Australia's were used for television. This is kind of messy, but you can see here's Madrid, here's Goldstone, here's Australia for the really high gain antennas. Then you had a bunch of other sites for 30 foot antennas, including some uh, from ships at sea. And, uh, so, all this stuff had to be developed and installed, integrated and installed around the uh, world as part of the Apollo program, although some of it was already in place for uh, Mercury and Gemini, but a lot of upgrades required. Collins was also the integrating contractor for the 30 foot uh, parabola ground stations around it. So here's the 85 foot, 20 kilowatt uh, transmitters. <coughs> C-band C microwave for connection to other places and the, uh, the links to, to Goddard. Uh, here's, a, here's an image of a 30-foot antenna where three ships and 11 ground stations and had these 30-foot systems. And then there's the 210-foot antenna, which are still used by JPL for their deep space missions. This, these are their primary deep space antennas. Although, this diameter has now been increased by uh, some number of meters, not a whole lot, but it decreased the gain necessary for the Pluto mission, for example. And uh, these, again, these large antennas were required for good television from the distance. And by the way, um, I, did I, uh, I want to talk a little, about, a little about the, intelli the television system. Am I, am I, am I, am I, I'm out of time. Am I out of time here? Uh, Host, <laughs> or can we just still have a few minutes? Okay. Um, so, um, I sat. Well, actually, Ray Green, who was the uh, resp engineer responsible for for the first television camera for Apollo, sat kind of over my left shoulder in, at a desk in in the office we occupied, and um, we talked a lot. And uh, Ray. Uh, was a good friend and we'd play chess at lunchtime, which I didn't know how to play and he'd always beat me. And at some point he came back very frustrated because uh, if the, if the television camera was not welcome early in the program, either by the astronauts and it was highly challenged by NASA for his, whether it was required or not. And Ray had already been developed, the prototype had already been developed by RCA 
it was a slow scan version of the, you know, the, the additional television camera. Ray said, I keep having to justify keeping the camera on the on the spacecraft and as part of the mission. And he says, I'm under direct orders. I cannot use public relations or images for the public as one of my, I cannot use that as justification for it. <laughs> Of course, it had to be either engineering or scientific justification. Of course, that changed. Some of the, the astronauts who were the primary objectors to television later became its strongest supporters. And that really happened after Apollo 8 uh, mission, which was such a tremendous uh, public relations event for the program. And the astronauts understood that and they changed their whole support for that. And subsequently, the higher the higher uh, rate, uh, higher bandwidth, uh, higher quality uh, television cameras were developed and used for all the missions. So, um, I think the next slide is the sun setting slowly in the west over the 210 foot dish of Goldstone JPL, which I was able to visit, visit in the very late 60s and part of an I trip to the East Cooper. And it was being used for Mars, uh, I think for the Mariner program at the time, some other deep space missions that NASA had under one of the, it's an amazing facility. And I think I can, uh, let's see. I don't know why this is not working. Here we go. Sometimes you got to go with okay. So this is one of the most amazing television events of the program, the culminating video. Which Fort 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 Take over. Now, here you have good thrust. Okay, 30 seconds. 308, your number. Okay, coming through 1,500 feet, and H dot looks good. Okay, so um, to me, that was. Getting you loud and clear. We have 45 seconds in counting. <laughs> All right. Um... Okay, hello. Figure out how to turn off that audio. Okay, Jeff, he's on time. Have a nice, cool one set up. 30 seconds to go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, I boiled, I had a much longer presentation than I did originally at the bar at the Boxborough, but uh, that was kind of a, it was too long. That, that session also kind of blowed it down. So if, if there's time for questions and then comments, I'm happy to. Great, George. If you could uh, if you could unshare so we could see everyone. Thank you. Um, that was awesome. <laughs> Well, there's just a lot of there's a lot of stuff, and you know you can find a lot of detailed documentation online now in the NASA archives and other places. I had a lot of documents that I saved from my 1960s work at, uh, and reused those. But then I going online uh, four years ago when I did the Boxborough thing, prepared for the Boxborough thing, I found all kinds of that stuff available online as well. So if you want to do more exploration of some of the details, there's just a lot of stuff. Um, I do have one question. Um, yeah. Why was a circle around the moon? Um, was it due to gravitational pull or just because it was easier? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, why did they go into lunar orbit? Yeah, yeah, around the moon, yeah. Right. Well, um, they had to go into lunar orbit uh, for some number of orbits to allow for the separation of the lunar module uh, and the command service module and then the uh, deorbit of the, of the lunar module to uh, and to pick and to land it at the pre-designated spot so this command, uh, command service module continues in orbit with a single astronaut <clears throat> and then uh, 
when the uh, lunar module, the, the upper part of the lunar module takes off from the moon, it rendezvous with the command service module still in orbit around the moon. Astronauts transfer into the command man module from the lunar module. The lunar module is separated again from the command service module. And um, I don't know if it remained in orbit or some of them I think were programmed to uh, crash onto the moon, but uh, and the command service module fires its uh, its engine with the hypergolic fluid uh, uh, propellant and oxidizer and uh, and goes into trans-Earth trajectory on its way back to the Earth. Is that was that the gist of the question or answer to the gist? Of no, that's that's more than what I anticipated, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Thanks. George, would you, things, yeah, go ahead. Would you know if I was ever found out whether there were any other uh, governments or agencies listening in on the dial links during uh, Earth orbit or other times? Or was well, NASA sure, the only one? <laughs> no, I, I'm sure there were. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm positive there were because we had a, at North American, uh, on top of the engineering building, uh, we had a, a dish connected to our test lab where we could actually uh, hear downlink and demodulate downlink data from the spacecraft. We couldn't transfer it. But we could. It was, it was, there, the, the Paul program was not classified. Everything was essentially publicly available. It might not have been easy to get, but uh, later on, there was actually a uh, a highly classified uh, aspect of the mission where in that service module, there were there were several bays. There was a bay for an oxidizer tank. There was a bay for a, uh, a uh, fuel tank. There was a bay for the uh, hydrogen oxygen fuel cells and other environmental control components. There was a, a bay for to putting, to put scientific instruments into. And there were a lot of, there was actually a lot of science done uh, on these Apollo missions by scientific instruments mounted in that, in that bay. Um, and, and, and at one point, some of our engineers were, uh, were separated from our group and transported, uh, transported to another facility on, uh, in Downey. Even where that was, they couldn't tell us. And they were given very high <coughs> security clearances. And all I know is that they were dealing with um, Perkin Elmer, which was a primary contractor for optical systems for Air Force reconnaissance satellites. Okay. <laughs> so I suspect there were some very highly classified uh, uh, optical equipment <clears throat> in one, some, one or more of the missions that were, I don't know, I think they were primarily there for taking very detailed pictures of the lunar surface. But because they were losing, using technology that was also used in reconnaissance satellites, uh, it was highly classified. We'd have lunch with these guys, and they was they said we have to take a different route back to where we're working every after we leave lunch every time, so nobody can figure out easily anyway. So that's yeah. well, that's speculation on my part because they couldn't really tell us anything. But that's that reflects all I know. It's, it's speculative. I I really don't know. In the amateur radio world, were any of the uh, UHF and VHF uh, pioneers like Sam Harris and the W1BU gang, were any of them tempted to, uh, well, I, to listen I in? Heard, I have heard, and you can probably find information on it by mm. searching online, that there were, in fact, one or more amateurs that were received maybe even the S-band communications from Apollo, similar to what we were doing for our lab purposes. In, in uh, there were a number of that hams. Would be it would be an interesting thing to look at. It would. It would. There are a number of hams up at Haystack Observatory who probably would have found it awful tempting to uh, take a listen with the, with the dish they had access to. Yeah, I did a, uh, I did a presentation a couple, couple, three years ago for the Neshoba Valley Club and Phil Erickson, who is the assistant director up there, is one of the guys that uh, chatted with after. Uh, he wasn't around <laughs> during Apollo time, but uh, there's no reason to believe they, they, they probably could easily. I don't know, I don't know if they did. You're right. <laughs> George, yeah. uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. Um, in those years, there weren't too many uh, electronic calculators or computers. So most of the design was done with a slide rule. But can you comment on 
the development of computing equipment specifically for the space programs? Well, a little bit. Uh, subsequently to Apollo working for Collins, uh, and even on Apollo, I, we had the interface to the guidance and navigation computer, which was uh, especially a uh, hardwired, in effect, a hardwired program, general purpose computer. Uh, and we had an interface. We, we, I went to MIT Instrumentation Lab a couple months as a as new graduate, and I'm intimidated sitting around a table with all these PhDs to, to, to define what the, the electric, electric electronic interface will be between their computer and my telemetry equipment. We sent them a two, two uh, microsecond start pulse with some delay. Then we sent them a burst of 40 two microsecond clock pulses, each of which triggered a data, data bit coming back from the guidance computer. And that was came back at a 51.2 kilobit rate, which was di directly um, multiplexed into the an appropriate time slot in the uh, 51.2 kilobit per second output data rate from the, the telemetry box to the communication system, and then a stop pulse after that. That was done 50 times a second. So then subsequently, um, um, General Electric developed a computer uh, capability that was used at a, a kind of a pseudo mission control center at Downey to uh, demodulate the telemetry data and drive the uh, CRT displays. Uh, for in-house testing purposes, it was kind of a mini, a mini uh, um, mission control, but all the telemetry had to be uh, uh, demodulated, uh, uh, converted to its proper uh, units, and displayed on these uh, CRTs for the various subsystems. And um, so, I don't know. Who, who actually developed the computing systems that did that kind of thing for mission control? I don't know if it was General Electric. You remember in the early early uh, 60s, GE had a line of general purpose computers. And uh, uh, one, of, one of the systems they installed at the time, the college I went to, Dartmouth College in Hanover here, was used for one of the first college uh, timeshare systems on campus, which was, came online with, on the campus in 1963. And uh, teletype M33s or 35 scattered around the campus for students to use that computing system for any purpose they wanted to. You didn't have to take a deck of punch cards up to the Oracle of the com computer center window, you know, and uh, come back the next morning to see if it, your program worked. But and then, and of course the basic uh, language was developed there by uh, John Kennedy and Tom Kurtz. So uh, um, then, um, so there must have been there were multiple computing systems. I'm sure there must have been a main. I don't. It'd be interesting to look into what system was actually <laughs> involved in mission control in Houston. Does anyone else know anything about? The, I mean, there were. There were a lot of IBM 360 systems that uh, was developed during that time frame. RCA about 1969 came along and tried to develop a, uh, a uh, IBM 360 compatible system. They built a big facility off of uh, 128 down there, what near Framingham, <clears throat> which was later taken over by Digital Equipment Corporation, which by the way, I, I worked for for 15 years from 79 to, to uh, <clears throat> 94. After coming back from the West Coast of New England, I picked up an MBA degree because I wanted to transition out of engineering more to the business side, but I was still involved in computer, computer communications at, at DEC. And at Collins, Collins developed their own line um, uh, in the late 60s, well, actually beginning in the mid 60s, used for uh, uh, roughly IBM 360 capability. And uh, we developed a ground data control and uh, secure voice, secure data, secure remote control for the Air Force uh, uh, satellite tra tracking capability for the reconnaissance satellite system. So I, I was involved with computers all along the way in integrated to computing systems, but uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I, I can uh, dredge out of my <laughs> memory about. But uh, interestingly enough, out of college, I was every system I worked on one way or another was a digital data system involving interval computers uh, of various capacities and sizes uh, 
up through obviously microcomputers and they use them. But I, you know, I had the opportunity to program a computer beginning in 1958 when Dartmouth bought a Royal McBee LGP30. Has ever anyone ever heard of that computer? <laughs> it was a desk-sized computer. It had a magnetic drum, and, uh, 4,048 word, 32-bit words of memory, and, and clock chop built into it. So the rotating drum controlled the clocking rate. It had vacuum tube flip-flop with diode logic. It's always been diode logic. And it, it was a fixed point machine, but there was a floating point interpreter that essentially used machine language instructions with a few others. <clears throat> and you could do a multiply in some number of milliseconds, I forget what it was, but, <laughs> but you basically had to fetch data from, from a memory location to an accumulator, perform an arithmetic operation on that data, store it in the back and store it back in a, a memory location on the, on the drum. And so I, I did some uh, engineering kind of I developed a program actually using an algorithm that solved uh, nth degree polynomial equations for a, for a, uh, a feedback control system server mechanisms course I was doing, <laughs> which was a basically great experience working at machine language level to learn about how computers work, which enabled me to communicate effectively with software engineers all the way for, for a couple of decades when we were in hardware, software development and test mode, where, whose problem was it hardware or was it software? And we got to troubleshoot and negotiate. And <laughs> it was very <right. laughs> Anyway, yeah, computers were certainly an integral element. That was that would be a whole other uh, history of application of computers so a subject to an interesting question. Yeah, on its own, but, but um, today uh, the phone people are holding in their hands <laughs> would, have, would have been three acres of buildings. <laughs> That's right. With vacuum tube, six SN7. Right, flip flops. Tubes and some transistor right. uh, computing. So you're holding in your hand something that would probably been an acre of buildings with computing stuff in it. Um, back in, in 19. And take a whole. Uh power plant to, to, to provide power to it. <laughs> yeah, well, in 1960, I was at the National Bureau of Standards in, in England. Um, I was a service engineer for a test equipment company uh, for a little bit there. And um, the computer was uh, computing. Uh, there was an accident on the new motorway north of London and a woman had was driving at 75 miles an hour and slid down the side of the highway and uh, was very badly hurt she she lived but anyway it was an example for computing and they it took this massive computer to compute or to restructure the accident and when i went there to change out a, a digital voltmeter which was very unusual um that's what they were computing, but they had this, there were 15 scientists and professors and there was a massive room full of um, tube flip-flops. I, I remember them being six SN7s, I think. Yeah. And um, so, you know, it was 1960. So yeah. we've come yeah. a long way when we come <laughs> a long way when you pick up this device and find out that it can compute everything that was computed to go to the moon and come back. Right, right. <laughs> well, you know, you yeah, it's nothing like a dual triode for a uh, for a uh, flip flop. And I think this LGP thirty I, I mentioned used twelve AX sevens uh, for their for its flip flops. They were seven. Yeah, you know, that's nine, that's nine. what I I remember. <laughs> I, I grew up with tubes. I got my ham license in fifty four at ninth grade and. Uh, I bought, my first transmitter was a Heath AT1, which was the first hand transmitter Heath get offered. Used a 6AG7 and a 6L6. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I, I grew up in the vacuum tube age. And I, yeah. Yeah, but the uh, what's interesting in college in 62 or 61 and 62, we could barely study vacuum tubes even at that stage. All the basically my vacuum tube knowledge came from my ham experience in building and designing my own stuff. Uh, uh, prior to mostly prior to college, 
as we jumped right into solid state, uh, of course, uh, uh, junction transistor design and, uh, sim you know, we learned about the equivalent circuits and analyze equivalent circuits and uh, the junction transistors right into solid state at that early point. All right, very good. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, you know, uh, I think George has my email um, address. So if anybody wants to send me a note, or George can share it with uh, or Dan, and, and uh, happy to try to respond. But uh, yeah, I've got several several boxes up in the attic filled with uh, Apollo documentation that I took with me. <laughs> None of it's classified. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, and but. There, there's been so much interest in the program that there are many archives out there. You might one of the uh, sites you might want to uh, just do a search on is Curious Mark, M A R C. Curious M A R C. Those guys are actually putting together. Well, they started out putting together a a uh, Apollo guidance computer, and now they've extended their work out in, out in the Silicon Valley to. Um, <laughs> To re recreate and put and get operational a complete a columns or a, a, a Apollo communication set of equipment which they they managed for. And actually, for the PCM telemetry, I actually saw one of those on, a, on an auction site several years ago, and I was tempted to bid on it because that's what I was responsible for. But it finally went for three over three thousand dollars, which was more than I wanted to pay anyway. But there was a more recent one that was in the thousand dollar range. So that stuff, that gear is still out there uh, and people are still interested in it. These guys uh, are interested in getting it actually working and functioning as, as an Apollo communication system. Happy to hey. stick around as long as anybody wants or you have time. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you, George. Great, great. Great presentation. I think we should all unmute and give George a uh, a big round of applause. Thank you for for coming to our meeting tonight. Fascinating. I love it. It's my second time I've seen you do a presentation on this, George. It gets better and better. Yeah. What was the first time? At <laughs> uh, Boxborough. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was kind of messy at the time, and I kind of ran out of time. I didn't, so I boiled this one down, and uh, I appreciate that. But uh, one one quick thing about reliability, extreme reliability requirements on the program, and there was an extreme the complicated qualification process for com at, down at the component level and said you could traceability to the actual mine and ore that was that was created components <laughs> was required. So this team of quality control people went to Ellen Bradley, the resistor company, which I know you've heard of. Where these were all carbon decomposition type resistors at the time. And they did this pitch to Ellen Bradley about if, if they wanted to sell us resistors, uh, they had to go through this whole qualification program and the story I got directly from one of these guys was at the end of the meeting that Alan Bradley said, well, you know, we've never known one of our resistors to spontaneously fail. We have no data. On it. And not only that, we will we make more resistors uh, after we throw the main switch off at five o'clock as the equipment is running down than you will ever use on the Apollo program. <laughs> so uh, you can buy our resistors if you want, but they're off the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's other anecdotes like that, but uh, it was fun to work on the program, and it was really a uh, you know a grind it out engineering process. It was uh, there were you know we we weren't thinking about we were heavily involved in day to day issues. We 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 wondered many of us will we ever get there by the end of the decade, but. Uh, uh, we were we were totally absorbed in day to day problems. We had some transistor reliability problems uh, uh, at a certain point, resulting from some corrosion uh, of lead contacts to the, to the internal semiconductor. There was always something happening, and work you just work you work your way through it with basic grunt. I call it grunt engineering sometimes. <laughs> Anyway, good. Glad to have done it. Uh, happy to meet you. Hope to run into you at, at Marlboro if I can get down there this year and uh, or near fest if any of you get up there. I imagine some do. I, our club is going to have a massive, hopefully, a massive uh, 
number of tables with a bunch of stuff that has been donated to us from Silent Keys. And I've got my own unintentional collection of stuff over, over the decades now. So look for the Great Bay Radio Association uh, location there at near, near Fest in May. So, so Selena, you may want to stop the recording at this point. 